One Sunday morning in 1985, a 23-year-old man set off alone into the Spanish countryside to photograph an ancient structure just a short distance from his home. At first, everything seemed normal. It was a pleasant day, there had been no interruptions, and he had no difficulty getting the pictures he wanted. However, when he got back in his car for the return trip, he realized several things were horribly wrong. His vehicle was filthy and its odometer showed more than 150 miles that could not be accounted for. When he arrived home, he was shocked to discover that it was no longer Sunday. In fact, it was Monday evening, meaning that he had somehow been missing for 30 days for hours. And worst of all, when the young man developed the film from his own camera, he saw an image after image of horrific things, nightmarish hands and faces that he could not identify. Over the next several months, a grim picture would emerge, both literally and figuratively. During his routine field trip, the photographer had been kidnapped, but his abductors were not human, and he had the photographs to prove it. Photographs have long been considered the smoking gun of paranormal evidence, right? Although they have yet to prove the existence of the supernatural, there are many researchers and enthusiasts alike hope that someday irrefutable visual evidence will at last vindicate centuries of speculation. This, of course, has not been the case yet. Each passing year has made photos less and less reliable. I mean, first there were hoaxes and models, then digital manipulation came along. Nowadays, AI like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion threaten to cast doubt on even the most compelling photographic evidence. Therefore, a case can be made that is not newer, but rather older photos that might provide the best proof of the paranormal. And this is exactly why the pictures taken in 1985 by a Xavier Claris Jerez are so striking. And not only do they predate digital manipulation with tools like Photoshop or Adobe After Effects, but they also represent something that is rarely ever caught on camera. You see, we have plenty of pictures of UFOs, but we have very few, if any, pictures taken during an alien abduction. Yet, that might be precisely what Xavier captured in 1985. Now, Xavier was born on August 7th, 1961 in the city of Almeria on the southern coast of Spain. After discovering his passion and aptitude for photography, he soon became a professional and moved to Barcelona, the capital and largest city of Catalonia. There, she shared a residence with his wife and his brother, Jose. Xavier ran a small studio of industrial drawing and photography. Now, on Sunday, July 21st, 1985, Xavier planned a quick excursion. He wanted to spend the day in Val Gorgina, which is a small hamlet just over 30 miles down the coastline. It was a 45-minute drive, and he only planned to be gone for a few hours at most, just long enough to photograph an ancient megalithic structure known as the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil. Now, this structure is, as the name indicates, a dolmen, sometimes called a portal tomb. Dolmens can be found throughout the world, but are especially common in the Korean Peninsula and in Western Europe, where some of them are up to 7,000 years old. The dolmens typically consist of several standing stones topped by a large flat slab of rock. Now, within these structures, human remains were often interred. Some might have once been covered with gigantic masses of soil heaped into burial mounds, while others were left exposed to the elements looking like gigantic stone tables. Now, over the centuries, dolmens have been associated with a variety of supernatural entities, from fairy 
fairies to jinn to giants and spirits, and in the case of Chavier, extraterrestrial visitors. Some dolmens are enormous, while others, like the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil, the place Chavier intended to photograph, are relatively small, standing only five feet tall. Now, curiously, a Roman-esque church by the name Santa Eulalia de Tapioles sits on the property today, leading some to speculate that the dolmen was actually moved to its current location sometime in the distant past. You see, construction of the dolmen at Valgorgina is dated somewhere between 3500 and 2000 BC and has a long-standing reputation as an ancient site of occult pilgrimage. Now, there are tales of the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil hosting witches, sabbaths, and dark rituals. I mean, even today, it attracts the attention of contemporary pagans and magicians. In fact, the very name of the nearby village, Val Gorgina, might well be derived from the Basque word Val Sorhinha, or Valley of the Witches. Now, this is the exact setting that Xavier was heading to that day in 1985. Mysterious, but by no means dangerous. He soon discovered that while the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil might have been ancient, it was by no means inactive. Now, according to a ufologist by the name of Antonio Ribera, who brought Xavier's case to the English-speaking world, that Sunday was a glorious day without a cloud in the sky, and Xavier set off at around 8 o'clock in the morning with a full tank of gas. He took with him two cameras. One was an old-fashioned box camera that had actually he had made himself. The other was a Japanese-made Olympus OMB 35mm camera loaded with 100 ASA 21 DIN film capable of taking color photographs. For those of you old-time photography buffs, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Me, I'm newer to digital photography, so it's a little new for me. Now, it didn't take long for Xavier to reach his destination. I mean, there was little to no traffic at all, allowing him to reach speeds of up to 55 miles per hour. And so this this pretty much put him right at Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil sometime before 9 o'clock. Since he was by all accounts a very careful person, Xavier deliberately noted the mileage on his red Reno 5 hatchback. This is an important detail as it would shed additional insight on the strangeness that followed. So keep going. Now, Xavier got out of his car and began photographing the ancient structure. Now, by his initial estimate, he only spent somewhere between 90 minutes and two hours on site taking pictures with his homemade box camera. He did not use his new camera at all. When he felt like he had covered the dolmen from every possible angle, he hopped back in his car and had returned home. Nothing out of the ordinary right? Well, this is where it gets strange. Now, at first, he did not realize that anything was wrong. He felt like the day had just proceeded just as he had expected, little by little. However, doubt would slowly creep in. The sunlight didn't quite look right. He didn't feel like his regular self. He finally reached Barcelona and noted something peculiar. All of the businesses, from the shops to the restaurants, were completely open and filled with people. It was something he expected to see on a weekday, not a Sunday morning. But despite these hints, it wasn't until he parked his car that he fully realized something beyond his comprehension had already transpired. As he always did, Xavier shut off his engine and looked down and noted the mileage on his odometer. It showed that he had actually traveled 300 kilometers, nearly 190 miles, far longer than the journey to Val Gorgina. I mean, it might have seemed like a mere malfunction at first, but his fuel gauge had confirmed the reading. He had begun the day with a full tank of gasoline, and now it was nearly empty. Confused by this, Xavier stepped out of the car and things only got worse from there. Even though the region had been suffering a long dry spell so long, 
In fact, that the local farmers were worried that they had entered a drought. Xavier's car was filthy and wet, the body was covered in stains from thick, sticky substances, and his wheels were caked in mud. Where had he had been? It certainly seemed like his visit to the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil had not unfolded as he had remembered. And by far the most alarming thing that Xavier experienced happened when he set foot back in his own house. His wife and brother rushed to the door, a look of relief washing over their faces, replacing the concerned grimace that had been there only moments ago. They said, where in heaven have you been all this time? Where did you sleep? Now, by this point, Xavier is pretty confused. Rather than answer what he perceived as a nonsensical question, he asked them, why are the shops open on a Sunday morning? And Xavier's brother, Jose, replied, well, in the first place, today isn't Sunday anyway, but Monday, and the time is 6 p.m. We have been to practically every police station in the city and to several hospitals looking for you. We feared you had an accident, a traffic accident. It was absolutely bizarre. In Xavier's mind, it should still be Sunday. In fact, it didn't feel like more than a few hours had passed, but he couldn't deny the fact that the businesses in the town were open, nor could he account for the evidence provided by his odometer and fuel gauge. Xavier would check his cameras, and to his surprise, the numbering on his Olympus camera, the modern one, which he had not used to photograph the dolmen at all, by the way, indicated that several pictures had been taken. Again, if you're older watching this and have experience with older cameras from the 80s and 90s, you'll know exactly how this works. So naturally, Xavier was curious. He, his wife, and his brother suspected that whatever the film had captured might shed some light on his disappearance. So with the mixture of fear and curiosity, they developed the film and were terrified by what it revealed. Now, although some of Xavier's photos were in color, it is difficult, if not impossible, to find color copies today, even with the help of the internet. If you can do some digging and find them yourself, let us know in the comments below. Otherwise, the only source we have to work with comes from the May 1986 issue of England's Flying Saucer Review, which is a publication dedicated to the UFO phenomenon. Now, due to the print costs, the magazine interior was only printed in black and white. But even in black and white, however, the pictures are terrifying. The first photograph seen here seems to show a face. It is so symmetrical and clear that it is hard to imagine that it is anything else, or that it might be merely an example of pareidolia. According to reports from those who saw the original photograph, the face is green. There is a large, wrinkled forehead, a pair of eyes, a flat nose, and a mouth with what might be fat lips. Now see, this right here proves that aliens were far into doing the duck face way before our modern thirst traps. The second photo shows more of the head, although the face is hidden in shadow. This is because the photograph was captured with Xavier's homemade box camera, which only took pictures in black and white. The original photos developed from his film were too dark to make out any details at first. Now, since the camera had such a long exposure time, and as we will soon discover, were most likely captured in near complete darkness, to enhance the contrast, Xavier took the original plates and made a contra type of them, then produced several prints, subsequently making each image cleaner and clearer. Claritin Clear. clear. Now, despite the limitations of this format, we can make out a few crucial observations from the second photograph. The head in the picture comes to a conical point, implying the presence of a helmet. From the sides protrude a pair of ridges, or perhaps large high-set ears, the artist's recreation scene here attempts to combine the first two photographs into a composite of the entity's face. Now, these are not the only mysterious photographs that Xavier captured that day. There are pictures of hands, which were also captured with his homemade box camera. We're left to assume that, like the face, these were green as well, although obviously none of that coloration shows up in black and white. Now, unlike the face, it is hard to imagine these hands belonging to a human being. Photograph three clearly shows a hand against a white background tipped with long, thick fingernails that might be better described as claws. Some have described the hand as 
scaly. Now, photograph four shows the same hand or the right hand of a similar creature grasping some sort of circular device against a similarly blank background. Exactly what it is doing remains a mystery. Suffice to say, Xavier was alarmed by these developments pardon the pun, especially in light of his missing time and the state of his automobile. Ask yourself how you would react, faced with such terrifying and bizarre implications. Do you move on and let a mystery linger, or is the curiosity too much to bear? If you want answers, who do you even turn to? The federal government, because we've seen how well that's been working out. Would law enforcement help at all? Maybe a priest. Xavier had reached out to a parapsychologist, Kale Ramis, a Vienna-born researcher who had moved to Barcelona some years prior. Now, it's worth noting that this was not the first time that Carol and Xavier had met. And actually, about seven years before his terrifying visit to the Dolmen, Xavier and his brother had contacted Carol to discuss some uncertainty settling dreams they experienced during their childhood. See a connection here? Maybe. Now, researcher Antonio Ribera explained the nature of these encounters in the May 1986 issue of the Flying Sauce Review, writing this. For example, he had been visited in his bedroom at night by small humanoids of the classical type known to ufologists, big pear-shaped heads, small nimble bodies, who showed him a number of things, including pyramids. But he always had the feeling about them, the little beings, that that they were benevolent and would never do him any harm. We do not know, of course, whether these visitations truly took place and were real or whether they were oniric. That is to say, of a dream-like nature, but, but Xavier's own feelings about it is that these small beings were very real. While these childhood experiences may have been nothing more than just dreams, Xavier knew that what unfolded in July of 1985 was something different, or at the very least unfolded in the physical realm rather than in the mystical realm of his dreams. When Xavier shared his photographs with Carol, she was immediately alarmed. At once, she he suggested that Xavier undergo hypnotic regression in the hope of retrieving details that might shed some light on the 34 hours for which he could simply not account for. And so then Carol had arranged for Xavier to meet with a professor by the name of Francisco de Assis Rovati Heredia, who was a Spanish parapsychologist who had a great deal of experience hypnotizing other alleged alien abductees in the region. Now, Francisco had held a recognized diploma in hypnosis, whatever that means. Sometime between July and September of 1985, Francisco and Carol sat down with Xavier for his own hypnosis session. It was noted that Xavier had no lingering medical ailments. Researchers deemed him young, fit, and healthy in both body and mind. Now, later psychological testing supervised by researcher Antonio Ribera on November 15th, 1985, would confirm Xavier's mental health. Antonio said that the young man had passed his evaluation so well that instead of the usual three hours allotted for such an assessment, Xavier finished it in only 90 minutes. Antonio said that Xavier's IQ was 111, which is quite high and above the normal, and that the test revealed no psychotic traits whatsoever. Now, as for his character, Antonio added that Xavier was, in fact, quiet, well-spoken, intelligent, normal young man. Carol agreed with Antonio's assessment, saying that both Xavier and his brother were thoroughly honest, straight young men, quite unlikely to be guilty of committing a hoax. Having established a baseline for Xavier's honesty and mental health, Francisco and Carol would begin their hypnotic regression, and what they learned chilled them to the bone. Now, according to Xavier, he left the main road on the morning of Sunday, July 21st, 1985, and followed a sign in the direction of the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil, right away, something was odd. Even though the weather was fine and sunny, the road seemed shrouded in some sort of fog or thick mist. The next thing Xavier recalled, he was either sleeping or laying down on the ground near the Dolmen. Something came to his attention. At first, it seemed like rain. 
However, Xavier soon realized that it wasn't rain, but rather a sort of liquid, sticky and very nasty, possibly Sabaro pizza grease. Now, at this point, Xavier says that he got on his feet and headed for the car. However, to his dismay, he realized that it was locked and he could not find his keys. So he stood there rummaging through his pockets over and over again as the mysterious substance continued falling from the sky. During the hypnosis session, Xavier recalled that at this moment, he wanted nothing more than to lay down and go back to sleep. However, he was unable to due to the continued precipitation. He said, this water that's dripping won't let me. It's certain it isn't water and everything's covered in clouds. It wasn't until this moment that Xavier noticed that the trunk of his car was open. He went around to the back, found his box camera, and began taking photos. Xavier said this, I'm photographing the sky and this rain that is falling. I'm afraid my plates will get spoiled and I don't want to get out the other camera. It might get ruined. I want to get in the car and go back. This sticky shower seems to be the reason why Xavier never remembered taking any photographs of the dolmen with his modern camera. He didn't want his new equipment to get damaged by the strange weather. It was at this point in the hypnotic regression that Xavier declared that he was not alone. I could see them, he said, referring to the entities at the dolmen. He clarified that whatever these things were, they were different from the ones he remembered encountering during childhood. I told you there was a correlation here. While Xavier's earlier interactions had been with beings we would most likely identify as gray aliens, whatever he encountered at the dolmen were far more frightening. Their faces repulsed him to the point that he didn't even want to look at them. Nonetheless, he still managed to notice enough details to paint a ghastly picture of his visitors. He described them as almost as tall as I am, just a bit less. Their faces are horrible. None of the beings seem to wear any clothing, but were instead covered in dirty gray skin that Xavier said was furrowed. They all seemed hairless. I don't like their faces, Xavier said. I don't want to go on looking at them. It didn't matter how much Xavier disliked the appearance of the beings. They had different plans, Xavier said, they want me to go, they want to see how I am, but I don't want to go, they're making me go. Despite physically resisting, Xavier claimed that an invisible force had seized him. He was pulled down on a nearby slope, the dolmen sits on top of a hill, by the way, only to stumble halfway. And somehow he recovered, either under his own control or under control of the beings, and made his way to the mouth of a cavern. Xavier was in full panic. He could hardly breathe. He wanted nothing more than to turn around and flee, but had found himself walking deeper and deeper into the cavern, darkness slowly enveloping him until at last he stood somewhere beneath the earth. Xavier said this, It's horrible and up above they're enjoying themselves. You could see there seems to be light coming in, but it's pretty dark. I don't want to lie down and rest. I'm suffocating. There's very little air. Xavier remembered a disgusting smell inside the depths of the cavern. In another interview with Antonio Ribera, he compared the odor to a mixture of rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide, and coke, a porous coal-based fuel that in its mineral form is gray and hard. This smell might have come from whatever was coating the rocky walls of the cavern, and Xavier remembered them dripping with a sticky substance perhaps the same material that had fell upon him and his car earlier. Now, at this point, Xavier's abductors began fiddling with his box camera. They seemed intent on prying it open, but were completely unable to do so. Xavier said this, they're trying to open the box camera and they will ruin all the plates. Why are they so stupid? They don't understand anything about photographic material. Obviously, they're gonna be ruined. As soon as they open it, thank goodness the other one told them not to open it. He seems to understand a bit more about it. The beings began telepathically communicating with Xavier in his native tongue, Spanish. Finally, they revealed the reason behind why they had taken him from the surface. They informed their captive that they wished to stick something into his arm. Xavier naturally resisted, but found himself 
himself under the same inexplicable control that had drawn him into the cavern against his will. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, he knew that the creatures would get anything they wanted from him. Now, one of the entities, who unlike the others, had hair on its head, produced something resembled a catheter except it did not seem to be connected to anything else. Xavier later revised that same statement and even produced a sketch of the tool that they used seen here. This may be the device that the hand is seen manipulating in the fourth photograph. After thrusting one of the needles from this apparatus into Xavier's arm, the being with the hair began extracting something from his body. Xavier declined to identify it as blood and instead simply insisted that it was a liquid, perhaps plasma? Whatever it was, the device filled up and his kidnappers began groping at Xavier's arms. He noticed that their touch seemed sticky. In fact, he described the sensation as revolting. At this point in Xavier's hypnotic regression, Francisco and Carol asked the question on everyone's mind. Where are they from? Xavier's response shocked them both. On the tape, he clearly seems to engage in a one-sided conversation with his kidnappers. Why don't they want to tell me they know where I come from? That planet doesn't exist. I don't know of any planet called that. I don't know of any planet called Cassiopeia, such as you are talking about, nor any place of that name. I still don't understand what I am doing here, nor what you want. Why am I here? Just tell me I don't understand it. You are making me more and more confused than what you have put in my arm. I don't like it one bit. If there are any marks left on me, they'll be seen, and nobody will believe it. And why isn't it of any interest to you that nobody should believe what I tell them? But anyway, I don't want to say anything to anybody because they're going to take me for crazy and I don't want that. I've always been a very steady sort of person, never had this sort of thing happen to me. I don't believe I'm in here, I don't want to believe. I must be dreaming it. At any rate, it will all be over when I wake up. I'm not in here and you don't exist. I can't believe it. Now, Cassiopeia is, of course, well known to astronomers. While it isn't a planet, it is indeed a constellation, easily recognizable in the northern sky. Xavier said that the beings began taking pictures of him with his box camera, although the whereabouts of those photos remains uncertain. They also cut off most of his hair for reasons they never disclosed. Apparently, aliens can travel interstellar space, but are poor stylists and even worse photographers. Xavier said that the haircut was so mangled, he visited a barber the very next day to fix their poor workmanship. Even through the surrealism and horror of his encounter, Xavier had two primary concerns. First, he remained worried that the beings would ruin the film in his camera. And secondly, and most importantly, he had no idea what they were doing to him, nor what they had planned to do with the samples they had collected. Maybe clone him or even worse. At last, one of the beings revealed their plan to Xavier. If you can believe it, their agenda is perhaps the strangest part of his entire abduction. Check this out. It seems as though the entities that abducted Xavier wanted to in his words, make another one just like me and then wipe me out. So my hypothesis about him being cloned was right. Put another way, the beings in the cavern seem to be interested in cloning Xavier and substituting this double in his place. It would take over his life. To what end remains unclear. The only thing Xavier was certain of was that they would succeed under no circumstances. My willpower is stronger than theirs, he declared to Francisco and Carol during his hypnotic regression. This development rose a startling possibility. Was the Xavier Claris Jerez on the couch the actual man who walked into the cave that day, or was it a clone? Xavier had assured them that he was indeed the original and not a copy. He he knew that this was the case because, to everyone's surprise, he actually claimed to have met his clone. You see, the next thing that Xavier remembered was falling asleep, or becoming to a full consciousness inside his car. It appeared just as it did when he returned home, dirty and covered in a greasy and foul stain. According to memories recalled under hypnosis, Xavier sat in his vehicle and in humorous detail, noticed that his abductors had added insult to injury. Not only had them taken him against his will, extracted blood from him and made a clone, 
they had taken the two sandwiches he had packed for lunch. At this point, he was completely hangry and disoriented, and Xavier looked into his rearview mirror and saw that he had an unexpected passenger because sitting in the back seat was a perfect double of himself with one fascinating exception. His doppelganger did not reflect his new haircut. Instead of the short hair he now wore, Xavier's double had the same long hair he had started the day with. Francisco and Carol asked if perhaps Xavier simply mistook his own reflection for his clone, but he was adamant that this was not the case. Xavier described not only his unwelcome passenger, but also how the rest of the day unfolded, saying this, He is dressed exactly like me in every way, and he has his long hair unlike me. He can't be the reflection of me, I've got my hair short now. We are entering the motorway now, and he has moved in front. He just laughs. He looks like my twin brother. He is reversed. He is a reflection, but he's alive. He's with me in the car. We are in the car together. Look, I'm going to leave him here now. He's got to go to his house, and I have to go to work. What's more, he was seen getting out. I've just met my neighbor. But he did not speak to me. Nor did he speak to him, and the other one says nothing. I don't know if he even knows how to talk. I can't believe what is happening. Man, it can't be real. I'm dreaming. But what's more, today is Sunday, and yet the shops are open. You know, why is that? Why are the shops open today? It's six in the evening. This is Xavier's bizarre encounter. It would be easy to dismiss as a psychotic break, if not for four key facts. Well, first... There is the fact that Xavier seemed completely of sound mind both before and after the events of July 21st to the 22nd of 1985, so you might consider him a liar. Second, and perhaps most importantly, he had photographic evidence that, while it might have been hoaxed, implied a certain reality behind his experience. A third, Xavier's arm bore puncture marks up to three months following his abduction that lined up with exactly what he claimed that was never wavering, by the way. In September of 1985, Antonio Ribera himself saw three wounds on his left arm arranged in a triangle about three centimeters wide on each side. And the fourth and finally, there is his double, which is an alarming development, was actually seen by other people in Barcelona, including including close friends, neighbors, and family. Antonio wrote this, When Xavier became aware of the existence of his other copy of himself, the very idea, of course, horrified and disgusted him. What might befall his mirror double, and why had it been created in the first place? What for? But, as can be well imagined, his anguish increased tenfold when a neighbor remarked to him, Xavier, what were you doing walking around like that near your place last Sunday? The neighbor said this soon after his return home. The next day, in fact, he having only returned home, be it remembered, at 6 p.m. on the Monday, his abduction having taken place on that same Sunday. This was not the only time that Xavier's double was seen. In his report on the abduction's strange aftermath, Antonio continued by explaining, Some days later, another friend of Xavier's mentioned casually that he had seen him, Xavier, on the Avenida Marques de Duero, popularly known as the El Paralelo, a Barcelona street that Xavier had in fact not visited for months. When asked what clothing Xavier had been wearing, the friend gave a description. It was precisely the same clothing that Xavier was wearing on that ill-fated Sunday of his abduction. There was, however, yet worse to come, because one night, Xavier went to have dinner at his aunt's. The old lady was amazed at seeing him. What? You again, she said, but you have just left, saying that you couldn't stay for dinner. On Saturday, November 16th, 1985, Xavier's double would be spotted once more on Barcelona's very own Paseo de Cologne wearing a distinctive Hawaiian shirt. It was, in fact, the same Hawaiian shirt that Xavier had worn the day he visited the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil four months earlier. Witnesses said that Xavier's double looked incredibly sad as it waited patiently for a ride at a bus stop. 
sightings of Xavier's double would continue until at least early 1986. And on January 12th of that year, a report came in that Xavier was seen wandering the streets of Barcelona wearing the same Hawaiian shirt despite the cold conditions. There is one final piece of evidence that might corroborate Xavier's claims, although it is entirely circumstantial. When Xavier and Jose Jerez planned to meet up with Antonio Ribera in September of 1985, he received a phone call just before they were scheduled to arrive. It was Jose. Apparently, they would be late for their appointment as their car had broken down right near Moncada, some 19 miles or so from Antonio's home. Xavier had been behind the wheel, and even though it was a Sunday, the Jerez brothers explained that they had been lucky enough to find a mechanic whose shop was open and who was willing to repair their vehicle. However, the mechanic was unable to find anything wrong whatsoever with the Jerez's brother's car. It simply would not work. They had to eventually take a taxi the rest of the distance to meet up with Antonio, and when the time came to go home, Xavier and Jose headed back up to Moncada, hoping that the mechanic had discovered the source of their problem. Unfortunately, he had not, and in desperation, the brothers tried heading home one last time, but decided to put Jose in the driver's seat. Now, to their surprise, the car started back up without any issue as if it had been fined the entire time. Now, despite these compelling correlations, Xavier's story was met with skepticism, even from the ufological establishment. Spanish ufologist Vicente Juan Ballester Olmos cited several issues with the case, predominantly what he called sloppy hypnosis procedures. It is true that hypnosis can, in general, lead to memories that are produced rather than recalled. In other words, the personal biases of the regressionist can influence the testimony of their hypnosis subject. Even Antonio Ribera, one of the first researchers to examine Xavier's case, noted this possibility. He suspected that the events of July 21st, 1985 did not unfold at the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil, but rather another undisclosed location. He pointed out two key facts that led to this conclusion. First, Xavier's odometer and fuel gauge both pointed to extensive travel not accounted for in his hypnotic regression. And secondly, Carl Ramis seemed well acquainted with the area and the dolmen having attended a gathering there, specifically with witches in the past. Antonio suspected that Carol either knowingly or unknowingly, introduced the location into Xavier's mind, which he then ran with. Antonio set about trying to pinpoint other dolmens in the area that might account for the mileage on Xavier's car and the fuel that he had used. And he pinpointed two other possible locations, one near Pala through Hell, northeast of Barcelona in Girona province, and the other west of town in the Rita Provence Payar region, near the municipality of Tramp. However, the topic of hypnosis is not the only thing that concerned skeptical investigators. Vincent Juan Ballester Olmos called attention to Xavier's past. He said, For me, it was a hoax, a psychosis case, an unreliable testimony from a subject who was familiar as an insider to esoteric circles, an individual who was a witness of so-called bedroom visitations. We have already addressed the fact that Xavier and his brother Jose had previous experiences, and in fact, knew Carol Ramis for years before 1985. This in and of itself is worth noting, but doesn't necessarily mean that Xavier was UFO-obsessed or eager for future experiences. But to the contrary, you see, ufologists once criticized witnesses who claimed multiple sightings, negatively nicknaming them repeaters. However, researchers in recent decades have suggested that people who see UFOs are actually more likely to see them throughout their entire lives. Some have called these experiencers encounter-prone personalities. It seems possible that Xavier might have been one of these types of witnesses. What's interesting as well, and this is actually completely off script, is that if you see in many of the Sasquatch and Dogman encounter communities, many people will actually not just have one encounter, but a plethora of encounters, sometimes with this same entity or being. And this happens a lot with Sasquatches or Dogmen, or as allegedly told and reported. Just an interesting side anecdote for you guys. Let's get back 
to the script. More interesting than Xavier's childhood memories is an event that supposedly took place just a few years before his abduction, an experience suggesting that Whatever happened in July of 1985 was not his first run-in among creatures at the Dolmen. Antonio Ribeiro wrote this. More extraordinary still, it now turns out that Xavier had already visited the Dolmen on a previous occasion three years ago. Moreover, on that occasion, there was also a period of missing time, namely from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Xavier has no clear conscious recollection of what happened on that day. All he knows is that at 11 11 a.m. and again at 7 p.m., he saw two triangles of light in the air about 10 meters or so above the dolmen. The upper triangle was upside down and into the lower one. All the colors of the spectrum were rotating from one point to another around each of the triangles. On the external triangle, the lights were going counterclockwise, and on the other inner triangle, they were going clockwise. Antonio expressed enthusiasm at arranging a hypnotic regression for Xavier's earlier encounter. Although it remains unclear whether or not that ambition ever became a reality. Instead, we're simply left with more questions than answers. Was Xavier conflating two separate events? Was he simply delusional? Or was he lying, trying time and time again to gain ufological infamy? If this was the case, he failed pretty badly. Because Vincent Juan almost said, after Ribera, no one ever worried about the case, and to the best of my memory, no one came back to it again. Probably it was too much, even for a gullible ufologist. Now, there is one final rational concern regarding the abduction case. Antonio Ribera pointed out that Xavier's simple homemade box camera should not have been able to take photos in the darkness of the cavern. That the camera, as Antonio pointed out, included a photometer which adjusted the shuttle aperture to the light, blocking the camera if the light was inefficient. Yet, Xavier's camera seemed to work perfectly, even if he did have to lighten the photographs after they were developed. Now, Xavier was unable to provide an answer for this. Of course, if he was lying, he merely speculated in his words that the beings possessed some sort of phosphorescence or radiance of their own. It's a convenient excuse, but the ufological literature is indeed populated with hundreds, if not thousands, of accounts of radiant light beings and other luminous phenomena that might have provided sufficient light for the camera to work. So, in this case, it's hard to say. Having discussed the possible problems behind Xavier's experience, besides simply how wild it sounds, let's take a look at the details of case. Can we find support that he is telling the truth, not in his photographs, but rather in the ways that his experience aligns with other alleged encounters with non-human beings? The first thing worthy of consideration is the mist. Was Xavier aware of the fact that strange mists show up in times again in UFO cases? If not, it may point to the reality of his experience. In his book, Hair of the Alien, DNA, and Other Forensic Evidence of Alien Abduction, he Ufologist Bill Chalker noted the preponderance of strange mist and fogs in UFO cases. He would write this. As ridiculous as this story seems, there are some interesting resonances with other encounters around the world. Xavier's bizarre tilt into the alien underworld began with the strange rain, mist, and clouds. These are remarkably frequent in UFO events. A few have collected more accounts of anomalous mists than author W.T. Watson whose 2022 book, Mysteries in the Mist, Mist, Fog, and Clouds in the Paranormal Chronicles, dozens of examples. One of the most famous incidents took place in 1952 and was even examined by the United States Air Force's infamous Project Blue Book operation. A Sonny Desvergers, a Florida scoutmaster, was driving three Boy Scouts home on August 19th when a strange light in the forest had caught his eye. He stopped to investigate, bushwhacking through the palmetto trees as far as he dared until at last he noticed an odd odor. It seemed to come from an immense oval-shaped object hovering over a clearing just 30 feet above the ground. The UFO released a red mist that washed over Sonny, and he subsequently passed out. He fled the scene after regaining consciousness. I mean, I can't say I blame the guy. 
It is also interesting to note that the slime seen in Xavier's encounter seems to have a precedent as well. Bill Chalker lists other cases from his native Australia that included substances similar to the kind that Xavier reported covering his body and his car. He wrote this, In some UFO cases, unusual precipitates are also reported. Given my background in chemistry, I always hope for the chance of examining such material closely. I know of at least three such cases from Australia. In August in 1971, in Gladstone and Rockhampton, Queensland, a very thin film of odorless oil was found on a car following a UFO encounter. In 1974, two women from Canberra who experienced a missing time encounter claimed that a viscous, sticky white material kind of like spider's web, was all over the car door. And a thick white substance, not unlike white paint, featured in the very strange car, Road Hazard incident, at Naminga in 1976. Unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to analyze these residues. Nor, unfortunately, was any analysis performed on the samples found on Xavier's car. He must have washed them off around the same time that he fixed his haircut. It definitely fits his personality. He told both Francisco and Carol that he had liked to have a clean car. There's also the possibility, though not indicated in any of the reports, that Xavier's goo, that sounds really wrong, simply evaporated. This is an especially common outcome whenever UFO reports include trace substances. For example, in the earliest days of ufology, landings and even some aerial sightings were often accompanied by a thin, wispy substance that researchers nicknamed angel hair. No, not like the pasta, this is something else. However, no matter how they tried to collect it, it almost always vanished before it could be thoroughly analyzed. There are even accounts of angel hair evaporating from sealed glass jars. Remember, too, the odor that Xavier noticed in the cavern. He compared the smell to rotten eggs, which most likely indicated the presence of hydrogen sulfide. This is one of the most common odors reported during UFO encounters, or many people claim the demonic realm, sulfur. It has also been associated for millennia with demons and the devil himself, which naturally brings us to the entities that Xavier encountered. He described them as roughly human-sized, hideous to look at, and covered in loose, floppy, gray skin. This highly specific skin description has been seen in other alien abductions. Perhaps the most famous is the 19 1973 abduction of Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker from Pascagoula, Mississippi. While the aliens that took Hickson and Parker don't especially resemble the creatures that abducted Xavier, for instance, the Pascagoula aliens had hands ending in crab-like pinchers. The description of their skin closely matched that of the beings lurking around the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil. However, was Xavier dealing with aliens in the first place or something stranger? Even in the immediate aftermath of his encounter, some ufologists refused to categorize Xavier's experience as an alien abduction. I mean, yes, he seemed to be taken... Yes, his kidnappers collected samples, but the editor of the Flying Sauce Review, Gordon Creighton, was actively pursuing another line of speculation surrounding alien abductions. Gordon was convinced that many of the experiences that was categorized today as alien abductions are, in fact, attributable to a race of spirits known specifically as the jinn. These beings come from Islamic folklore and are where we derive our modern term genie. The actual jinn, however, bear only a passing resemblance to the genies from our own modern fairy tales. In fact, an argument can be made that the jinn of Arabic tradition bears a strong resemblance to the fairies of Western Europe, who have been compared to modern extraterrestrials by many contemporary ufologists. But why, you might ask, would an Islamic spirit be found in Spain so far away from the Middle East? In case you don't remember in your history class, large portions of the Iberian Peninsula were once controlled by the Moors, Muslims who ruled the region from the early 8th century to the late 1600s. While spirits can presumably manifest anywhere they like, 
they seem unbothered by quaint human concepts like time and space. The presence of an Islamic influence in the area suggests that the Moors might have brought the beings along with them as they spread their beliefs across Spain. There is also the fact that, like European fairies, jinn are closely associated with ancient monuments, including dolmens, like the Dolmen de la Pedra Gentil. Now, in the early 1900s, author Mario Rosa de Luna wrote that the doors which lead to the other world of the jinns are the dolmens, menhirs, and other old druidic remains in Spain. It's an interesting connection. Flying Saucer reviewer editor Gordon Crichton was so convinced of the jinn explanation that he even published Antonio Ribeiro's account of Xavier's abduction with the title The Jinn and the Dolmen. Now, this shouldn't be taken as absolute proof that jinn were involved in Xavier's abduction. I mean, after all, Gordon Crichton, I think I might have said Crichton at one point, and it's Crichton. Gordon Crichton was kind of gin crazy at the time and deeply immersed in Islamic literature, myth, and legend. We also have the fact that the beings Xavier encountered literally claimed to be from outer space somewhere in the constellation Cassiopeia. However, let's consider one final detail that lends credit to Gordon Crichton's gin or spirit theory. Xavier's doppelganger. It is easily the strangest part of the story. I mean, while clones and doubles do appear in many UFO cases, they are rarely ever seen by eyewitnesses after the fact. What's more is they usually greet witnesses aboard UFOs, meaning we rarely see them created in such a short span of time. Now remember, Xavier was only missing for 34 hours. How would you harvest genetic material and create a fully fledged clone in such a narrow time frame? While it seems possible that alien technology might be advanced enough to create a full adult in less than two days, this seems remarkably quick. There is also the issue that somehow the aliens seem to have instantly recreated Xavier's outfit fit the Hawaiian shirt that his double was seen wearing months later. These details beg the question, are we dealing with technology or something better described as magic? While doubles don't feature especially often in Jin legends, there are some tantalizing hints here and there. One type of closely related Islamic spirit, known as the Karin, follows us from our birth to our death. It is often compared to another self, representing our internal struggle between good and evil. Now, the folklore surrounding the jinn's European counterparts, the fairies, makes the connection to doubles much more explicit. One variety of Scottish fairy, described as a co-walker, follows people their entire lives, much like Islam's Kareen. A co-worker, co-workers, co-walkers are doubles of their owners and even assist as pallbearers at funeral banquets. After their owners die, they return to fairyland. Sounds kind kind of like an amusement park. In many fairy stories, the fairies themselves are often indistinguishable from human beings except for one telltale sign. Some Scottish brownies were believed to have hands whose fingers were all knit together. Some Irish banshee legends describe the entities as having no nostrils or a webbed foot or a single front tooth. These Mistakes are so common, in fact, that preeminent fairy scholar Catherine Briggs even dedicated an entire entry to defects of the fairies in her celebrated fairy encyclopedia. She wrote, Among the many beliefs held about the fairies, there is one strand which describes them as beautiful in appearance, but with a deformity which they cannot always hide. Now, similarly, Jinn legends sometimes depict the beings as entirely human except for one obvious difference. The late paranormal author Rosemary Ellen Guiley wrote that even when they appear in beautiful human form, jinn are said to still have a physical flaw that exposes their true identity. What, you might ask, does any of this have to do with Xavier's alien abduction case? Well, as it turns out, many doppelganger stories describe the entities as being an exact match for their owners with the exception of the detail that seems a little off. 
in other words, if Xavier's double was actually a djinn, fairy, or spirit in disguise, it stands to reason that we would expect to see one of these mistakes as well. Now, luckily enough, Xavier's own testimony points to how his clone was a close but not exact replica of himself. Not only did his double have different hair, but Xavier described it being reversed. Here's the wild thing. This exact same mirror image of a clone appeared in another Spanish case from December of 1977. Now, after dozing to sleep in his truck, Miguel Herrero Sierra awoke to a brightly lit flying saucer landed by the side of the road. Ufologist Scott Corrales, who runs the website Inexplicata, or maybe it's Inexplicata, right? The Journal of Hispanic Ufology described what happened next. Miguel suddenly heard a voice calling out in the morning gloom and suspecting it might be another stricken motorist proceeded to go off into the distance to render assistance. He found that the source of the voice was a man wearing a white outfit asking him to follow him. Thinking it might be a mechanic, Herrera fell in behind the figure. To his astonishment, he found himself being led to a hat-shaped object that projected a metal cylinder to the ground, and a door opened. Herrera would later tell Madrid's El Diario newspaper, I found it foolish to think about running at the time. If they wanted to hurt me, they would have done so already. Now, the cylinder, described as metallic and icy cold, continued an elevator that led them to a large control room. Herrero suffered a brief blackout after his first view of the craft's interior, subsequently being able to write detailed notes as to what he remembered seeing. The crew, from his notes, were all dressed in white overalls, except for one who bore a red circle on the upper left side. The character introduced himself as Major Martins advising Herrero that the vehicle was able to materialize and dematerialize upon command. Unusually talkative, the humanoid described the craft's operation and other intricacies. Herrero was told that the non-humans had come to our world by chance. They had calculated a given speed at which to travel, found a void, and reached our dimension 2,000 years ago. Notably, all of the beings that Miguel encountered appeared human, including, as it turns out, his own double. Miguel's clone was identical to him, except for one small change. Herrera was shocked at first, then frightened when he saw a man looking exactly like him seated at one of the stations. He said, My first reaction was to approach him, not to strike him, but to see someone who looked just like me up close. He was prevented from doing so, advised that he could not come into contact with his doppelganger or his negative, as Herrera put it. He was exactly like me, except that the scar which I bear on my left cheek was on his right. Now, this detail is mentioned only in passing, like it's just a little quirk, yet it may hold the entire key to unraveling the nature of these experiences. Why would these doubles have such small, yet entirely noticeable defects? There isn't a a great answer if they are clones extraterrestrials seem to be highly advanced so you would think that they'd have enough attention to detail to get things accurate fairies and jinn on the other hand have a wealth of myths and legends describing the imperfections and the doubles that they produce it seems as if this phenomenon whatever its true nature has been with us for as long as we can remember it just changes and adapts to our expectations. Where we once saw magic, today we see technology. The Xavier abduction is startling for many reasons. I mean, it is a very wild story and up to a certain point, incredibly well documented. It even includes what many would consider the holy grail of ufology, alleged pictures not only of extraterrestrial visitors, but aliens caught in the act of kidnapping a human being. Yet, for some reason, it is rarely discussed. The original photographs seem hard to find. So why would ufologists let such an important case simply fall by the wayside? We are reminded of Vincent Juan Olmos' words. Probably it was too much even for gullible ufologists. Yet today's modern UFO landscape readily accepts plenty of cases and claims that are equally absurd, perhaps even more so. And those claims, unlike Xavier's, completely lack any and all evidence. Since ufologists have given so little attention to the Xavier abduction, since the 1980s, 
we are left wondering if this account is the one that got away. Even though so many of the trails have likely gone cold, it's unclear if Xavier is even alive today. Perhaps someday soon, an especially determined researcher will pick up where Antonio Ribera left off and bring us closer to what remains one of the most fascinating accounts of alien abductions ever recorded. But more importantly, I want to know what you guys think. So be sure to go ahead and leave me your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. I would love to hear from all of you. Also, if you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that big old red subscribe and like button for more great content like this. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll see you guys in the next great episode.